like to call to order the Kentucky Regional School Committee business meeting of February 4th, 2020. Roll call, Dean Adams. Here. Joanna Blanchard. Bill Buell. Here. Emily Dwyer. Here. Marie Filzani. Here. Dick Rogers. Lisa O'Connor. Here. Chris Redding. Here. Dina Trotter. Here. Agenda is the minutes. Can I have a motion, please, to accept the minutes of the business, finance, and operations meeting of January 21st, 2020? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Can I please have a motion to accept the business meeting minutes from January 21st, 2020? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Um, update on school committee subcommittee meetings. Um, Emily, teaching and accountability. Working on scheduling, mostly on my end. Okay. Soon. The brief policy. Um, we had a meeting last week, and we're going to have another meeting nine to eleven thirty on Tuesday. There's already eleven. Okay. Um, this is. This is something I'm going to add that I haven't spoken to anybody about yet, but I think at our next school committee meeting, our budget discussion needs to go into some depth similar to what we did last year with regard to breaking out kind of the changes, the new things we're doing in elementary schools, middle school, high school. Um, I think just presenting it and then not really kind of going through it isn't what I would like to see happen from the finance committee, so we can add that. So like last year we did like a couple different things. I think you've gone through revenue. We kind of went through special ed when, when um, he was here a couple months ago. I forget when he came. Um, but I still think we need to talk more in detail about some new things in our budget. So that's the February 25th meeting? Right. And then I think we vote on the budget for the following meeting. The 25th meeting is also the public hearing. Right. Okay. Absolutely. And Dana, anything on communications? Okay. No updates. Okay, thank you. And public comment? Seeing any? Okay, so from here we're going to the superintendent news, Dr. B. All right, thank you very much, Madam Chair. We have a few things and I have a presentation. Uh, <clears throat> first, I wanted to let you know that we were awarded, uh, we talked last meeting about the partnership we have with Harvard uh, regarding our civics program for eighth and ninth grade, and we were awarded a $25,000 grant uh, for that partnership. So that's a very beneficial of the, the freight cost there. Uh, also, some sad news, Barbara Trogler, some of you may know her. She was a long time kindergarten first grade teacher at Page, uh, but she just passed away. So I want to make the school committee aware of that. Uh, Sarah Treen, she's one of our very fabulous teacher uh, here with us in Pawtucket, and uh, she was a, became a national Eureka trainer, uh, and that means, so Eureka is the math program we use, so she gets to spend her summer traveling around the country training other school districts and teachers in Eureka math. Uh, so that's fabulous. Um, you have the crest, I know I emailed all of you, uh, so the crest had that requirement, uh, they, they're required to notify all member districts if they apply for 
mortgage or property, or property acquisition. So that's that letter is here. It's also posted up on our website. Uh, let's see. Oh, and Ben Bolio cannot be here, so I'm going to pass along some of his news. Uh, first, he wanted to uh, make mention that Kentucky Hockey won the 64 last night over Sagas. Uh, Amanda Davies, Josh Tivo, Henry Bryan are all moving on to the MIAA North Sectional Championship at MIT next week. Uh, and then, that's very good at this. We want to point out, remind everybody that this Thursday, this Thursday at, at 7 o'clock, we have the Understand Overcoming Stress presentation. That's part of our six-part series. Um, that's this Thursday, February 6th at 7 p.m. in the Middle School Auditorium. I'd like to thank, I know we had a few folks who were there last, uh, last Monday. 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 Last Monday. <laughs> where we had the um, bullying and cyberbullying uh, meeting. There were about had about 40 folks, uh, 19 administrators between Kentucky and Triton. So it was, um, it, the presenter said it was the most people he's ever presented yeah. to. I was not, I, I thought it was a much better showing than we had last year when we attempted this one, only two people showed. So it was good. Um, and I believe those are all of the big pieces I have for you, except I have a presentation. I'm very excited about this presentation. So I think Marino is here to help as well. Uh, some time ago, and in the strategic plan, I had referenced this thing called the virtual ombudsman. And in the strategic plan, so throughout the strategic plan, uh, we talk about communication, communication, people knowing their roles and responsibilities. So at the start of the year, and last year as well, I talked about my four pillars. My four pillars. Number one pillar, pillar is uh, children first, always. Second one is communication. The third one is professionalism. And the fourth one's great. Those are my four pillars of education. You have to be good at all four of those things of building policy. So the communication one is what this focuses in on. And it's a really big piece. So uh, <clears throat> those four pillars took us to the new strategic plan. And within the strategic plan, the four overall things were those four. And those are strategic plan. We approved them. And number one and three is where we're going to look at right now because um, <clears throat> this virtual ombudsman addresses these three strategies of our strategic plan. I'll, I'll be honest, I did not think I would have this out. I was hoping by the end of this year, um, but it's been, Ms. Moreno's got to do a little bit of talking, explain what he did, but he's been sitting down with me and been able to go through and do a lot of the detailed work uh, to get this done. So if we go to the next one, it's, you'll see, so a, a virtual ombudsman. That is what we're talking about. Trying to get, if you go to the next one, the, what an ombudsman is. So I never heard the term. So if you haven't heard the term, it's okay. Uh, my wife, when she was working at UNC, uh, had this position was posted as an ombudsman. And she went and talked to the office and wanted to know what it was. And they talked, they said, it's, it's for a big university. It's essentially a person that anyone, any employee of that university can go to, explain what their problem is, and the ombudsman leads them down and says, hey, here's the people you should probably talk to. Here's the resources you need. So they help them solve the problem. It's very, uh, it's, it's, a, it's something that's far more common in European countries, uh, but it's a great concept. I mean, if I want to know some information, I'd love to be able to, instead of making 17 phone calls and getting redirected, I'd love to go to one person who can just leave me down. We don't have budgets for that. Like we don't have a person to do that, so we have a Mary Ann. And Mary Ann tries to lead them down the best direction. But we know that people typically don't call anymore. They do things online. So this is an attempt. This is a pilot of what I'm calling the virtual office. So, Okay, uh, Mr. Marino's going to talk here in a second about what it is, but ultimately my vision was this. I wanted anyone to go on to our website to click on the, I, I, I have a question or something like that, you know, the word Clippy, everybody remember Clippy? When, I see you're typing up a letter, and Clippy would help you with that letter, <laughs> but usually was not helpful. Uh, it's that same type of thing. If, if you wanted help, you click on this button, and then you say, Am I a teacher, student, 
Am I a faculty member? Am I a prospective parent? What's my role? And then once you click that, it goes to the next thing. Here's the thing, here's what I'm, what I'm wanting to know about. And you click on it, and it moves further down. Ultimately, I wanted people to get to the end of a choose your own adventure where it says, hey, here's the person you need to talk to, here's their phone number, here's their contact information, here's any paperwork that you need that goes with this, and here's any policies that are associated with what you're talking about. Um, and we think we've addressed the large number of questions, the frequently asked questions that come up. But you'll see in a second, it's also built into it. A, if you have something that we haven't thought of yet, there's a form built into it. We can just fill it out. It goes to us. We look at it, and we start adding on to the whole thing. So, Mr. Wayne, go ahead. Yeah, great. So when I came on as the, the um, coordinator of policy, procedure, and curriculum, Dr. B kind of tasked this as one of my primary first goals. He said it was something that he wanted to achieve in the next couple of years. This is something that we can move it up. And the reality is that schools everywhere have a hard time communicating effectively. There's information everywhere. And when I started this process, we have a ton of information that's available to our community, to our parents, to our students, to our staff. It's spread out, it's far, it's wide. Sometimes it's not as clear and easy to access. So in taking the steps to create this virtual ombudsman, I want to think of three things. First, who and Dr. B um, made it clear who the, the key stakeholders were, and he just mentioned them. The parents, the staff, our students, and prospective families. Those are the people who we want to make sure have a one-stop environment where they can get the information that they need, where they can get policy information, where they can get how-to information, where they can get the numbers of the people who are important. So the question is, what information do they ask for? And this was really the, the thinking part of the activity. Having 11 years experience as a principal, having worked with Dr. B for a year, having gotten to know the community here in Kentucky for the last few, talking with the other principals, I really wanted to identify the real key questions that come up first, and then think more in depth. Me as a parent, what do my friends ask when they, they come to me as a principal and say, hey, I need to learn this about my kid's school. What do we need to know? So I wanted to do our best to make sure that what was really covered as thoroughly as possible. But as Dr. B said, we're not going to think of everything in the first go around of this. So we did build in there an opportunity for people to ask for information that may or may not be there. And then the question is how. So this comes down to creating a resource that is super easy to access, easy to see, easy to navigate. So if someone has a question, they can come here and they can find their answers. So with that, I, I have the resource here. I made it live for the first time about 25 minutes ago. So we can just take a look. So ultimately, this is a virtual ombudsman. And when you just scroll up real quick, we try to bring it to life with some photos. Um, the first three photos are photos of Kentucky Regional School District folks. A parent and a, a student on the left. Uh, I did check to make sure the student could be. Um, yeah, we can show that. That makes sense. Uh, photo, we have a couple teachers from Merrimack, and we have some high school students for the students. I did take a, a, a standard pic from Google for the, the parents moving into town or prospective parents. But one of the things I wanted to kind of just demonstrate for you is how somebody would use this. So I'm going to start with the... Oh, choose me. Yes, sir. I'm a teacher and I want to go on a field trip. How do I, what do I got to do? So you click on Ombudsman for staff. It's a good one to pick. You can see right there. So one of the things on most of the pages, we wanted to make sure that the, um, the icons were easily seeable so that people wouldn't, so that people would know that they had to scroll down. We didn't want to make it tricky to change. So if we wanted to click just on here, teacher wants to run a field trip, here's what we, we have for them. We have as a district a protocol that teachers should follow when they start planning a field trip. So what are the timelines? Um, should be easy to use, just click down and then there's a link to the, the form that exists that guides the teachers in an eight week period of time that will allow them to plan a field trip as well. Yeah, and one of the other important parts about this is I was very frustrated as we have teachers filling out paper copies of everything. So what Mr. Reno has done is we first are consolidating all of our documents uh, to make sure we have one singular document uh, that gets submitted and it's, you can 
complete it digitally, and in some instances you can submit it digitally. On some things you can't, because we have to have an actual signature, uh, but it should speed up the process quite a bit for the teachers who are trying to get information to us. This is a good example of that. Three elementary schools for people each had three separate how-to forms and three separate forms to fill out to submit to one central location. So we consolidated all those. Now we have one district-wide field trip planning form with one field trip-wide um, application, essentially. So if they were just clicked on the, the field trip planning timeline, that would bring them to both the timeline and to the forms that they would have to fill out. They can be filled out digitally. All of the PDFs that we have district-wide are converted into fillable PDFs. So they can fill it out digitally, then just print it and send it um, after signing. Um, with the timeline comes the form, so it's right there as well. So each one of these is a, a, a collapsible menu. So if they have one specific question, they can just click on the, the collapsible menu. It also goes into what are the ratios that we need to have to help with the planning process. These, this is all information that was available in a variety of places, but we've tried to put it together in one place. And then at the bottom of each page, Includes the policies that we have as a district that govern the decisions that need to be made. Now, when we are putting together the agenda, Ms. Trotter <coughs> decided to ask a question. I said, What would you want to know? And you said, I don't remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> it was answered, so she forgot the question. Oh, was it the calendar? It's the calendar. I need to know something so, about the calendar. calendar. So it didn't exist previously, but there's an example. Yeah, it was last we week. weren't thinking about the calendar. So I, as soon as you left, I said, the thing, I talked to Ms. Marina. I said, Listen, the calendar, that comes up all the time. If I'm a parent, I want to know what the calendar is. So now it's on all the different areas. What was the calendar? So that was a real life example of the. the part of this resource that Dr. B and I just referenced. It's a request for information. Because this site was built in our Google environment, we've created a, a Google form that is linked to the bottom of each page where if the person, if the staff member didn't find what they were looking for, maybe there's a part of planning a field trip that we didn't consider that they need to learn more about. They can fill out this form and then two things will happen. The first thing that will happen for now um, this form, whenever someone fills it out, it'll come directly to me. And there'll be two things that happen from that. First thing is I will get back to them within a 24 hour period to give them the answer to their question. So that they have their answer right away. The second thing that will happen is then we will go back to this document into the, the, the draft form. We'll update it to add that information. If one person has a question in a school, there's a really high likelihood that that question is being asked by other people. So, this is our, because this is our, our, our beta version, our pilot version, we're approaching this knowing that we haven't answered all the questions. But we don't want to distribute this thinking that your question's been answered and if, if it hasn't been, then it's not a good question. We want people to know that all questions are good questions. If a parent, if a student, if a teacher or a prospective parent has a question that they need answered, we want this resource to be able to answer it. So the hope is that once this gets released publicly and it gets publicized a bit, people will start coming to it and people will start asking all the questions so that we can really build this out to be a comprehensive resource, a one-stop shop for all the potential quandaries that people find themselves in that they need answers to. So, so right now, this, is, this isn't live up on our website yet, right, Mr. Mayor? So for purposes of this meeting, I made the link um, they would have I made it available, but it's not posted. So, so I wanted you all to see this first, um, so you understood what it was. Uh, I, for me, like Mr. Brown said, this is our beta version. This is our first crack at this. Uh, I'm sure eventually we can have a journalist that's right on there that you just talk to and it can tell you everything. But for now, I thought the visuals were a good way to approach this. Uh, people don't like to read a lot. You can see a picture. You have a question of bullying if you're a parent. You <coughs> click on it. And that question, it, it takes you through all the, all the information we have in the district regarding bullying policies, approaches, reporting, all of it. Um, so it, it's just nice to have one stop shopping as a consumer uh, to get that question answered. We'll have it as a prominent part here. I will do a little PR thing, asking people to go on and use it more, more than anything else, just to get the feedback from what are we missing for questions. We know aesthetically it's a very good first crack at it. Uh, 
so how things change later on might evolve. But as far as I know, I don't know many places or any, I don't know of any that have something similar to this. Um, there's a consumer. I think it makes life easier. If I'm, a, if I'm working in the district, if I'm a student, I, if I have questions about my benefits or I'm gonna be on medical leave or I, I wanna take personal, all of that's up on here. So we tried to think of as many as we could. So just, I was excited about it. I just wanted to share it with you. I have one question. The calendars are up there. Yeah. <laughs> So how are you gonna? Are, are you gonna do like a little video telling people what this ombudsman is? Yeah. Just because yeah, if you say ombudsman, no one's gonna know what it is. Well, right, because if you like have it on our website and it says visit our ombudsman, people, yep. are gonna, what's that? Yeah, so. I mean that's it is just is begging for another. It could be a very creative video because you could have me in the Swiss Alps or something like that, <laughs> and I might be in fine an ombudsman, or, or I might just plan and drive. It depends on how much time I have, but yes, I'll, I'll, we'll post it up live. Just so, they, it, it, so, that people so people can it. know what it actually means, because some yeah, parents I, might just go in there and be like, what is, what is yep. that? I, I want to know, I want, I want first people to know that it's there, and then they get to use it and know what it is, so there'll be uh, a big explanation. We'll, we'll put it up beforehand, but I'll make a, a stink of it. Yeah, so one of the things, let me just go back to the communication for a second. It's nice to be, um, it's nice to be seen instead. Of one of the things that I always worry about in the rule of the principal is updates. So one of the things that will be coming is I'm going to do a, a full analysis of the information that's out there and make sure that Dr. B has a, a, a clear timeline of when things need to be updated. For example, um, we have standard test, standard test administration up there on the student side and on the parent side. Those dates don't always come available very early, but once they're up there, we want the parents, the day that they go up, we want the parents to be able to click on that link and see, okay, my kid's gonna be testing the ELAM cast in grade three on these days in April. So there's gonna be a, a, a resource that's available to the whole administration. Of, Here are the aspects of this resource that need to be updated periodically, annually, um, or in a time-sensitive way, so that we can make sure that we stay attentive to that. Because at the end of the day, one of the quandaries we had was every single time we change a policy, mm. it gets impacted up there. A person or position changes, it gets impacted up. So every time we change something, it's changing there. Dates, calendars, no matter what it is. So we have, we're creating just a whole list of if this changes, we need to <coughs> spot, we need to go and change it in here as well. That way we're not losing track of where something, someone's name is uh, in some document that we find in a school committee meeting because it's in a handbook. Um, you want to have the correct information out there. So one of the things that I am trying to do as we're creating some pages is I am trying to keep some things a little bit more generic. For example, on the parent transportation side, if there's a student behavior on the bus, who do I call? Instead of putting the individual name of each principal and assistant principal on that page, I put contact your school principal or assistant principal and I put the school name with the phone number. That way, if there are changes in, in leadership, we don't have to remember every single time to go back and, and find all the different pages that require updating. So I have tried to leave some places a little bit more generic to make sure that the maintenance of this, this resource is a bit more manageable over time. All right, Mr. Marino, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And Madam Chair, that is, I know that's longer than usual. Does anybody have any questions? Or? <coughs> any questions? So thank you. I guess that's a, thank you. It's a great thing to have. Thank you. Look forward to seeing it up and running. Um, the next item on the agenda is the Whittier School Committee representative uh, from Merrimack. Um, so we um, we have placed an ad um, for applicants, and Paul Tucker, who is um, the current Merrimack uh, rep for Whittier, for Merrimack for uh, the Whittier Tech, has um, applied for the position. He was the only applicant. So um, I would like to have a motion to vote now Paul Tucker to continue as the Merrimack <coughs> representative of the Whittier Regional Vocational School District. I move Second. his uh, application. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes, I send them letters. Thank you. 
The next item on the agenda <coughs> is the fiscal year 21 budget update. Greg, would you like to? Uh, sure. When last we met, I handed out your budget books and informed you that the governor would be speaking when you got home to tell you just how much extra money we're going to get under his brand new educational plan. And the superintendent reminded us that most likely we're going to go to the big cities. And lo and behold, he was exactly right. Uh, <laughs> if we were Lynn, we would have got 31 million. We are Pentucket. We got $67,000. Uh, <laughs> but after that, the governor's budget does come out. And about two days later, the, the reality hit. Uh, we lost about 570 bucks over what I thought we were going to get for Chapter 70. So pretty good guess to start. We picked up a quick $104,700 in regional transportation. Not bad, right? And then they turned around and took it away from us with $64,000 in extra charter school expense and $13,000 extra in cho choice expense. So we basically, out of what I thought we were going to get from the state after all the things, we picked up an extra maybe $20,000 total. Not going to help you with a $600,000 deficit in any great way. <clears throat> the next thing we do, as I explained we would do, is we waited for the net school spending numbers to come out. This is, tells you how much the towns are going to be required to pay, and then we sit down with them and see what they can afford to pay. Um, as usual, <laughs> net minimum spending files into our two-step assessment methodology, and there was their usual wild shift that popped up, and I brought everybody over to see what they could afford. Actually, almost all the costs flowed into Groven and Merrimack. Almost all of it. So if we, before we could have picked up another 250 from each town, now it's, if we talked to the, I talked to the three towns and got an idea of what they could do without an override after the two-step methodology could do it. Um, if we passed a budget at 44,050,000 instead of 44,664,000, so it's like a $614,000 cut. Uh, Groven, over what we thought, would come up with an additional 15,000. Merrimack would have to come up with 112,000. Normally that sounds horrible to our good friends in Merrimack, but they made out pretty well in Whittier this year. So they indicated that they could afford that number. And West Newbury has to come up with $15,000 more than last year. I'm pretty sure they can afford their $15,000. Not over what we asked for in the budget book, over what they had to pay this year, $15,000. God, I love two-step. Um, so when you net it all out, we're going to get less, if we don't go for an override, about $80,000 from the towns than we thought we were going to get, we had hoped to get. So uh, I guess the question then becomes, do we begin to work towards that $44,050,000 budget number, or do we work in a different direction above that that would trigger an override in both Groveland and Merrimack? Um, I heard a little bit of Groveland, I don't know if Emily watched it last night, or Dick of the Groveland Selectman meeting. <laughs> yeah, and they, uh, they were going through their budgets line by line and all that stuff, and they were, when it got to us and the finance director explained exactly what I just explained to you about that with the new school about the, the tax rate and things like that. They were pretty much adamant across the board that they would not be supportive of an override. Now, not supportive of an override can mean a whole bunch of different things. Um, when we, if you send a budget to them that would require them to go to an override, it's up to them to pick the override number. They only have to give you a dollar more than last year. So if they could give you 250 and you said, nope, you need 500, they don't need, need to make the override 250. They can make it $499,999. And indicating in past indication is that's probably something along the lines of what they would do if they don't want to support an override. Because it works out well for them. If it passes, they have the money. If it doesn't pass, we don't get the money and they get an extra $250,000 to play with in their budget. So it's kind of a no-lose for them. If you push them into override, that's what they can do. I'm not saying they will. I'm saying that's what they can do. So I guess as we go forward, as we're talking about, like you said with Chris saying, to get into the depth part of the budget, that's one of the considerations that the biggest consideration, I believe, that you're going to have to make the decision on of what we're going to do with the budget to a final number. How we get to that final number, there'll be a whole bunch of discussion on that. You know, obviously, positions and things I've been working on 
in other areas looking at that I'll present to you. But that'll be your biggest decision first and foremost because it gives us the direction of how we're all going to work together to get to whatever number we get. But 44050 is your max number without an override. That gets you to town meeting with an approved budget. So that's where we are right now. <laughs> now some of the 44, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Some of the 44, uh, 664 that you came up with in the budget is still an estimate. So GIC and things like that. So that number could. Um, but that's, the last, that's the last number I'm waiting for. Like I said, when I talked about some things have already happened, yep. I've looked at. Um, we're still waiting on that. We're still waiting on the governor's numbers. We got the final assessment number from Essex Regional Retirement, but I usually can get some. I got an extra $5,000 we can cut out of them. Okay. Yay. Again, another big <laughs> help. Um, there's a few numbers. I took another look at pupil transportation. If you want to go um, to the full day kindergarten without a fee, we also, we were finally, as we're going through things, hey, it's on us. We don't need the, we don't need the bus at 12 o'clock anymore. Mm -hmm. So I sat down with the contractor and all that fun stuff and went through it. We can cut $62,554. So not only do you get to go to full day K and not charge anybody, we get to save a little money too. Um, we looked at subs at the high school. Um, a lot of communities are going to no subs at the high school now, only because the children are older and things like that. So what they'll do is they'll report to the cafeteria. We already have a person there anyways. And with kind of, I think the superintendent can explain it better. We've seen it. Um, no, the teacher will say, "Look, read, read these pages. There, you're the high school. You know, they they're not behavioral problems anymore. They're older children and stuff. So unless the teacher is going to be out for a long period of time, I see the look, Emily. But this is what places like Belmont, Lexington, these are. The, this is what they're going to. No subs at the high school. It's like alternative learning day in school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was the, their older kids, so they don't have any behavior issues. Well, no, I'm saying <laughs> that can't be. We, we already have a person who sits in the cafeteria yeah. every day, so for study periods and things like that. So it'd just be they'd yeah, be taking the idea would be, So if there was a long-term sub, yeah. you would need a sub. On a day-to-day -day basis, um, if there's a sub that comes in for a day, yeah. teachers now have the ability to use Google Classroom for those assignments. We see it on alternative learning days already, anyway. So in high school. Children could report here, and it's going to be taken, and the assignments up there, so they'd be able to go ahead. And we still keep a line item for long-term subs, yes. in case somebody leaves. And I'm, yeah, I'm sure there'll be some discussion about whether you want to take it all, or if a teacher's going to be out for a week, you don't want the kids to sit here for a whole week, so you might call in a sub for a couple of days if that situation arises. So maybe you don't take the whole 52, but somewhere in the 40, mid 40s to high 40s range is probably quite doable. Um, On average, how many? Subs, do you need on a daily basis? More well, than we can get. We already, we already have plenty of days where we don't, can't get enough subs now. The economy's too good. No, everybody's got a job. <laughs> and this is not just unique to us. This is unique. No, this is this a is, problem is, all over the state. Yeah, we, bus drivers, um, things like that, they're just hard to... Paras, subs, they're just... The economy's good, so you, you don't find them. But when you um, have, like, six classes all in the cafeteria, or how many are you looking at? I don't think we'd have that many. I think on average, I don't see that many a day that teachers call out, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is part of my question. Like, I would want to see some parameters around that. I don't know for how far you want to go down this road of discussing that particular aspect tonight, but I think I'm not wholly opposed to it yeah. exactly, but it does concern me. Um, particularly at, let's say, oh, this time of year when, you know, they might have 60, 100 kids out for any variety and suddenly you're missing five teachers um, in one building, which has definitely happened. Yeah. Um, I, that's a whole lot more kids in a finite space with what at certain periods sounds like might already be a pretty full run. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You don't so want to take it all. I just want to see some parameters around it. Well, that's what I was kind of saying. You probably wouldn't want to take it all. You want to leave yourself a little lee rate for those types of situations. Um, I'm taking a really hard look at out of district special ed transportation. As we had mentioned earlier in the book, it is now actually even more than regular transportation. I think it's time. I'm looking at it more in the vein at this point of the private rides. We have a lot of students who are go to a single school 
but a lot of those schools are close together. Um, we have a lot of out of district code there, and, and, and I know parents like the private ride. They don't like they get to get there five or ten minutes earlier, but at forty five thousand dollars a ride, it's if I can if a kid has to get to school five minutes earlier and share a ride with the person going up the street, if this school starts at 8.30 and this one starts at 8.45, we can start to look at saying you're going to start picking up more than one child. And special ed costs, as we said, have begun to balloon out of our realm to be able to come close to affording on an annual basis. So at some point we have to look at everything, regardless of whether or not the, parent, we, the parents like it at this point. because. They need, we promise to give them transportation. We don't promise to give them a private transportation. So we'll have to take a look at that. And we'll be sending out some notifications to look at a little bit when Mike gets back. Because sometimes parents just would rather drive their own child. And we'll pay them to do that as well. Yeah. So special ed transportation is line 233 in both. You'll see it's $1.29 million. $1.23 million is what we spend on special education transportation. There's some districts in Cape May Lee that struggle to even have any sped transportation. So that is exactly what they do. It's that parents that drive mm -hmm. children and they pay the yeah. parents instead. Yeah, you can't make them, but no. I'll make that offer because some people would say, I'd, I'd rather drop my kid off myself than have them get there 15 minutes early or something like that. But again, we'll start looking at all those fun things over the next week or so. And I'll have a better idea of that, what we can pull off to that number. I mean, obviously, in that type of a number, there's at $40,000 a ride, there could be some savings that we can take a look at. And then, as Chris said, we'll go over all the other fun things we can look at and take a look at as we look at next year, including reserve accounts for one-time money, things like that. But, we'll come, but like I said, coming into the next meeting, the big one's going to be what's the number for the budget now that we know what we can afford to give to the towns with no pushback. And that's something you can think about. Any other questions? Do you have any other questions? I mean, I haven't heard anything about any books. I've heard from one person who wants to set up an appointment with me. I haven't heard any other questions from the budget book, though, since we've given them out. So not so much a question, but people are definitely, you know, that it's up and out there. Um, mm -hmm. They're talking about class sizes, which can't be a surprise to any. Us, but, um, so I would, I would predict that if, so, so I think there was a great news article about a different school district that was uh, yesterday morning, and I spread that as comment that was unfortunate that this year we did not have uh, a good year of special education. And around here, that means, okay, we didn't have a lot of unexpected. Pentagon had a bad year. Um, so if we have this trend that continues, and we know it's continuing the entire North Shore, is that we are a district that doesn't have extravagant things. We don't have a lot of extras of anything. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we could anticipate that class size will continue to rise. There's not going to be much that we can do to count it. We've gone from 30% of our operating budget of special education to 34%. Each percent is worth about a quarter million dollars. Um, so I'm not... Mm -hmm. Next year could come by and we don't have any additions. Very helpful, uh, but it's just really hard to predict. Hundred percent. I'm just throwing out there what I know can't be a surprise, but a lot of people have contacted me about that piece because it's been something that has come up over the past few years, and that we have talked about as a committee. And I know you guys have talked about, and the building administrators have talked about. Um, and I think some people feel like that is not. I totally obviously understand what you're saying, but that doesn't make it easier for a parent whose kid is now in a class yeah. of 25 uh -huh. kids. So I think what, what we have to do is, so what I would advise the school community is you have to look at it and see what has the greatest impact on children. Yeah. And where is that going? Yeah. Where, where do you, so most impactful, the least impactful, then you start looking at the least impactful. Moving those, if it's uh, substitutes in there in the classroom saying, hey, here's your thing, you need to go online and do it, or yeah. come to the campus and go online and do it, but, 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 but why not? Uh, it's nice to have a small classroom setting, but it's not as big an impact as having 26 kids in the kindergarten class versus 19. Um, and I think even the way we structure our teacher allocation, it's something to be looked at as well. Philosophically, do we think it's okay to have um, early elementary classes equal to or larger than middle school high school classes? 
would argue that that's not a wise approach to developing our children's foundation of uh, learning literacy skills and math skills. And then there's sometimes in high school it is appropriate that you do have to have those modules. So it really is going through and making those adjustments. Of what, what, what can we afford to do? So the next item on the, on the um, agenda is the group organized international trips. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. So you'll like how we frame, we frame this instead of just saying GAP because we had this conversation, but not just GAP, but for any international trip. So what I'm looking for is a vote. Whether or not the school district is going to endorse uh, international trips, GAP is included in there. Uh, I spoke with Dorothy Presser last night uh, before our meeting briefly because we had had feedback that when Mr. Gilbert, when Mike Gilbert was here, he advised that um, he's advising all school committees that they are not, should not be endorsing international trips. What Dorothy said on that was, yes, that was something that we know Mike had gone around. That was his whole field of expertise. And she was there when I heard from Mike Long, who was the attorney for Mass. And Mike Long had said that if you decide to endorse an international trip, you need to make sure your eyes are dotted, T's and cross, the paperwork is there, the children understand the role, the roles, responsibilities, and consequences. The parents understand the roles, responsibilities, and consequences. And the, and the chaperones understand the roles, responsibilities, and consequences. And that everybody's on the same page. I think, Dick, you brought this up before. You really like the DECA, the way DECA had written up all their rules. So I'd like uh, to see that in our own handbook. So, so for, for me, when I look at this with international trips, what I say is if someone proposes an international trip, and Dorothy said she definitely recommends uh, a, a group like EFT, where you could go ahead with a Spanish or German group and say, hey, we want to go to this destination. Uh, okay, well, go ahead and you can get all those folks together. You get to go there for free, and EFT or whatever the group is, they assume the liability. However, if we do, GAP is not, you can't offer GAP in that format. GAP has to be that partnership. So GAP is unique in that instance. Either way, um, if a group does want to form a partnership with a, a group in Canada, a school in Canada, and they want to do a, a exchange there, you know, that that's, it, everything falls under the same. So we know what the comments are from the attorney. We know what the comments are from the insurance company. And it's all about negligence on both ends. Yes, anyone can sue for anything. You could be liable for anything if they can show that the people supervising there was negligence. Yes, sir. Okay. Having run trips, and obviously this is applying to the high school only, I, I think, you know, you made a very good point. We're talking about two things. Yeah. On advice of, a, of an attorney who was a previous member of this board, so he's familiar with uh, school policies, if you decide to do a form a travel club, first of all, people are going to sue. It's just a question of how safe or how protected are you from liability. If you do a group tour, I think that's a separate beast from the gap trip. And the gap trip is very vulnerable to lawsuits. And I think that if this is a motion, I think we almost have to split it up into two parts. International group trips, I think, are great. Because among other things, and it seems to be the focus of Mr. Jernay's letter, among other things, the minute the kids get on the bus to go to the airport on a group trip, uh, in this case, Pentucket has no liability, zero. The only time the liability happens is when they're on their way to the bus and when they get off the bus on their way back on the trip itself, and this is ironclad legal policy, you cannot be sued. If you run a group of kids to a foreign country to stay with families, you're exposing yourselves to a lot of things. And I think that in a very specific instance, unless this group, this board, is willing to waive its alcohol policy, I think you're going to have, we would view it as alcohol abuse. Uh, a German, French, Spanish family might look at it as part of their culture. But it, it's a question that's come up when I ran two trips, and I, we had, one trip was 40 people. Parents asked, could they take their child out to dinner? Sure. At that dinner, they had a glass of wine. There were repercussions afterwards from that, 
and the parents got very upset saying, I'm acting as a parent, the school has no authority. Then that was a gray area, it's not so much now. So I think that when we look at this, we have to look at two things, group travel and the GAP program. I certainly can support any type of group travel for the reasons that I've said. I cannot support, a, a, I think the times have changed and I think that a GAP trip, you are open to all sorts of problems. So, and, and I would also say, no matter what the trip is, if it's endorsed, that yes, we'll move forward with whatever international travel. Whoever's running that, I would suggest and advise that that person appear here and say, hey, here's our plan, here's the rules for the, the parents, the students, and the chaperones, even if it's just going from the bus to Belize or wherever it is that they're gonna go. Um, and the same for GAP, if that's what they choose. Do. But say. again, and I'm sure any attorney would would support this. With and I have nothing. My one of my two children went on a gap trip and had a phenomenal experience. Times have changed, and I think that you're asking several families to put aside their culture and to tell this visitor it's not going to happen. And then, as Mike Gilbert brought up, uh, among others, you're going to get sued. You could get sued. Whereas on an EF-sponsored trip, you can't be sued. And if the major concern of this body, among others, there's the cultural exchange and the value of that, if the, one of the negative concerns is a lawsuit, I think that's what you have to strongly consider. So, so ultimately, I know we've, I think we've had the conversation, and that's why tonight I, I, we just trying to bottle the ant and say, okay, Here's what our decision is on international trips. Okay, I'll be happy to make a motion when everybody finishes their discussion. You can make the motion first. Yeah. Well, my, my motion would be that we endorse uh, group travel. Through an outside vendor. Through an outside, outside vendor. vendor. With proper Wait a minute, travel. Cool. The minute you, sorry, just go, uh, it's called EF Tours. That's one of them. Yeah. And if you go on, well, they're all pretty much, the boilerplate is pretty much the same. And if you look at the brochures, it's very clear as to the fact that they have the liability. Mm -hmm. There's no way GAP can cover that. So, so my motion is that we uh, endorse only a group travel trip. Endorse only group travel. Overseas group travel. Through an outside. Through an outside agency. So, if I may, uh, that is whispered to me. That is actually what we do right now. Uh, it's not organized as much with the teachers. We have a teacher who receives a stipend, and if students are interested, they connect the students with a, a student. Is there a second on the motion? Second. Okay, any discussion? So, if we approve this, then we don't approve GAP. Is that? That's my motion. When? But wouldn't it be two? Uh, two votes? No. <laughs> Would it be two votes, though? One on a motion, I think. The motion is endorse only overseas group travel through outside vendors. GAP is, in, is an inside vendor. Okay. Okay, so we have both items on the agenda. Should we vote on this and then maybe? Sure. Because we still have gap done as a vote as well. I think we want to be clear we should vote it separately just to be. Yeah. So Wayne, you had your hand up? I just, <clears throat> uh, a couple of times ago, I spoke passionately on how much in opposition I was to the gap program. That hasn't changed at all. I need to go through the same thing. But if it comes to the vote of the gap only, dead set against it, and I could care less about the liability as opposed to our responsibility for safety for the kids, being an elected official. So consequently, uh, when we go to the gap after this vote, then I will definitely vote no for the gap program or any program that I feel our students will be in jeopardy for any reason, whether it's alcohol or otherwise. very difficult for, for me to support uh, a student staying with a family that I know nothing about. There's no vetting. 
Uh, and based on the gap language alone, it was inconsequential. I mean, there were almost no consequences at all. I could almost drive a car illegally and just say, I'm sorry. Uh, and so that, I haven't seen any language for that that's been firmed up. So my vote for the international will probably be yes, and the vote for gap will be definitely no. Okay, if you can vote when the time comes. Does anybody else have any questions? I just have to say, I think that the gap piece aside, I understand the concerns. That's not what this motion is. Um, I think that this is an invaluable experience that we can offer to our students. Um, the high school that I went to has offered these. It's a regional high school, six towns, so you've got a lot of complication. Um, and they've offered these trips since before I was in high school. They continue to offer them to, you know, from the AP English class going to Great Britain and, you know, getting some firsthand Shakespeare experience to the language classes visiting Spain, Germany, etc., Portugal, um, Brazil. So I think that these types of experiences your point is not lost that times have changed um and i think we need to consider that in keeping people safe um but i think that we would be sadly we would just be giving doing the kids a disservice if we don't offer them some of these opportunities in whatever way we feel we can do in a safe way because this is how we can open up you know some some worlds for some of these kids and make some connections that we just simply can't offer here um, as, as much enrichment as we provide. I like what Chris has done uh, with she and her husband have either together or at different times taken their own. Can you, can you not bring me into this please because my experience is very different than most of the other children in this district so don't use my experience. Well I think you shared your experience so that's already a matter but, but, that, that's a matter of record so my comment is a positive one. So just, I guess, keep it general that I can okay. understand both sides. Kristen, but when parents uh, take that responsibility, I think that is a superior idea where they take on all the responsibility, everything that's wonderful, handle anything that, that goes wrong. Um, I kind of like that. Bill? Just in closing, I mean, the reason I wanted to separate the two was. Uh, on both occasions, and this, from my experience with teachers running group trips, you have to turn people away. I think it's a very valuable experience, and I don't want to put anything on poor Mr. Seymour's plate, but a high school might want to consider a travel club. So that way, students who don't take Spanish but here there's a trip to Spain sign up to go on it, or France, or Germany, or Portugal, et cetera. So uh, that's my final point. I just think, I, I agree, they are extremely valuable, but again, I think we have to respect the fact that the climate has changed. Um, so, so the reason that I'm, I'm not wanting for you to use me as an example, I, I use that as an example because you were saying how dangerous Germany was. I had been to Germany, I didn't feel that way. So that's, it had nothing to do with the experience that we were able to financially give our daughters. We've been able to travel a lot of places with them. Most of their classmates don't get to do that. Most families can't do that. So the only way some of these students will ever get to experience that is through a, through like a school trip like this where the costs are kept down. Having it by an independent company, those companies are crazy expensive. My daughters have a few friends who have done it and I would say that what it costs one person to do is what it costs my family of five to travel. Well, not the the traveling part of it, not the airline part of it. But so, like, I'm just disappointed that yet again we're putting liability and, and all those things ahead of allowing students to have these opportunities. I feel that the way that this motion is won't allow that English teacher who has done this big, you know, study of Shakespeare, let's find this trip that we can bring and go over to, to England. It's going to be cost prohibitive if we have to have somebody else like the EFT or, or the different people like that coordinate it. It's not going to happen. Emily? I'm changing my point. <laughs> so uh, do you think that's true? What? I mean, the co so, because some of the, I, 
I don't think it's true. No. What you do is you shop. So, I think the trip right now, if you want to go, say I, to I Great Britain. To raise the hands. Okay, I apologize. Okay. Apologize. Thank you. Just move the vote. I move so, that we move the vote. Okay. I'd like to finish so, my comment, please, Emily. So, I still, what I said before stands. However, I think that it is something that not everybody has the opportunity to do personally although that would be lovely. Um, and I think as we look into it, if it becomes pro cost prohibitive, cost prohibitive with these groups, I would like to revisit it, not having like the actual price information, not necessarily gap per se, but how we might make these opportunities available in a way that is financially available to more students. Um. So I think we should go ahead and vote. So the motion on the table um, that Bill made and Emily um, seconded was to endorse only overseas group travel approval, which is EF tours, through an outside agency. Um, not my correct on that? No, what, no. Okay, um, so can you um, please read that? Yep, motion? endorse only overseas group travel through outside vendors. Okay. Okay, so all in favor? Okay, okay. Um, opposed? And motion passes. Abstentions, okay. okay. So then the second item in that section is the GAP program. Can I, I make chair? a motion to approve the GAP? I just <laughs> think I, it's. It's really disappointing to not be able to, I don't know, a lot of other towns, you know, everyone else does these trips. I don't understand, I mean, I understand the liability. I just, I feel like, I, I just feel like that we should offer us that a contradiction. Of Is that a solution. second? Yes. Is that second? Okay. So I think, do we need any discussion on it? Well, I guess I have a question. So, when we say everybody offers, like I think there are a lot of people who offer overseas travel. The homestay part, I totally get the value of that. However, I think there are some things about that that make me really profoundly anxious I guess um, about and some kids like that there are kids who wouldn't take that opportunity because that is not comfortable for them and so I wonder what which kind of goes back to the other piece too like what we feel like we could put in place to make that something that is not related to a company, like safe for them. Well, I feel like, mm -hmm. um, I just feel like if they apply for the program and their, parent, their parents understand, yeah. they understand. I mean, I know Triton <laughs> does it because I have uh, friends whose daughter just was over there last summer yeah. and stayed with a family and then the, the girl came over here and stayed with them and it was awesome. Like, mm -hmm. she had a great experience, and I remember in high school people coming over, and I wish I could have done that, but I just, I, I just think it's a, it is very valuable, and if there's some way that we can, uh, you know, offer it, I just think it would be great, but. Yeah, I just, I'm, I guess I'm just wondering what piece, like, I, I don't disagree. Um, my experiences weren't the homestay part of it. They were just international travel um, through the school. But I just wonder like what, what, what we as a group feel like would need to be in place. You know, like what is missing? Wayne and Emily. Uh, just parliamentarily speaking, 
the motion on the floor has nothing to do with what we can replace it with or how we can modify it or anything else, even though I appreciate that comment and what you're concerned with on what we could present to them, but that's not really part of the motion. But as far as input on your part, yes, that's your feeling, and yes, that's something maybe for a later date if we can. But the motion on the floor is to have yes for the GAP program or no, not what we can replace it with or tweak it. Marie? Okay, so um, all in favor of approving the GAP program. No. Sorry? No. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And Lisa, you would know? Yes, correct. Motion fails. Wait a minute. I said we can revisit maybe other programs in the future. Motion um, passes, right? No, the motion failed. No, motion, motion to eliminate the GAP program? No, to approve. No, it was oh, to no. approve. Oh, okay. That's so the yes meant yes <clears throat> and the no meant no. Otherwise, you'd have to go the other way around. We do that at our town meeting all the time. <laughs> I know, it just sets what's screw in my head. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Next item on the agenda is the um, fiscal year 21 school calendar. Sure. Um, so we're brought forward to the committee two drafts of calendars, and then even within option A and option B, there are considerations and al alternatives. Uh, we've had some initial dialogue with uh, the PAT um, about the, the teacher association, about some of the aspects of this. Um, so we bring some things forward to tonight, and if you bear with me for a moment, I'll highlight a few things, and then we can take some questions and considerations. I don't believe we put, we did not put on for a vote this evening. It was for discussion, and then to gather more feedback, and likely try to come back within the, in, at the meeting later in February, uh, potentially for a vote at that point. Um, some things to consider, Labor Day is very late this year. Um, or next year, I should suppose. Uh, it is Monday the 7th, so it's as late as it can be. And that plays some games with our, our schedule as it goes. Um, you all generally know how this works. We, we need uh, 180 school days. We actually schedule 185. Uh, with that, we have four professional development days as well. So we're, we look to schedule 180 student days, actually making it 185. 185th day cannot go past June 30th on the calendar, uh, and our four professional development days fit in there where we decide to put them. Um, option A is sort of our traditional calendar. Uh, it has our teachers starting for two days prior to um, prior to Monday the 31st of August. Uh, that proposes that Monday the 31st would be the first student day of school. Uh, in that calendar. Uh, there are options and considerations of that, of starting even earlier that week, potentially even having the teachers start on the 24th and 25th, and the students start that week in August on the 26th. So those are considerations that we could do. Um, this is your traditional calendar with a week in February, a week in April. There are early release days that are marked in there as well. Um, only three of them are backed up against long weekends. A couple are backed up against breaks long full week breaks, but only three are backed up against long weekends. Um, the other professional development days, we are really looking to put one on Tuesday, November 3rd. It's a national election day. There's a lot of opportunity regionally to participate in some professional development as many districts <coughs> around here do not have school that day. So an opportunity for us to collaborate and meet needs of some smaller groups of teachers who don't always get specialized PD. And then we drop the other day in uh, February 12th. So it's the Friday before the February break for a full day of PD. Option B, which is on the back, looked at an alternative way of scheduling um, vacations. Moving away from one week in February and one week in April, and rather doing one week in March. 
Um, we looked at the possibilities of option B, and we presented it to you tonight, but all well saying to you that it makes it a rather challenging schedule to really implement. And mainly, high school MCAS testing is in March, and while we can avoid it, it sort of wreaks havoc with the dates and, and everything around it. It doesn't play well. Additionally, if we did it that one week in March that's noted is the only week we could do that week of vacation, and that would be the start of spring sports season as well. That would be the first week of vacation. <coughs> now, we know, well, sure. now we know why no one does it in March uh, when, we, when we look at the calendar from that perspective. So, well, you see option B there. I, it would not be our recommendation that we move forward with option B. So I would rather, <laughs> for our purposes, focus our attention on option A and the alternatives that are there. Uh, there are other things we can look at, in particular in December, if we wanted to do two full weeks. Um, right now, it has students and teachers coming to school on the 21st, 22nd, and having an early release date on the 23rd uh, in the proposed schedule. Those can all fluctuate, but we all know as we move days one way, they move off the back end too. So however we do it, <coughs> we add days on in the middle of the year, we add days on in June. We take them off, then we can move days back. Uh, so as it stands with the exact calendar as it is there, the 185th day would be June 23rd, with the 180th being June 16th. Uh, just one question, since Mr. Once, uh, do we have any idea of just where the faculty is leaning here? Would you have an idea? We so we, we discuss, I can give you some input. Yeah, um, a or B? So, well, the faculty was certainly in favor of A. Hey, okay. yeah, That's all I wanted to um, We were looking, you know, one of our goals in this is to try and not have us get out late in June. That, that, that is a goal of a calendar, to try and get that last day as early in June as possible, to make the best use of the time we have. And I think the teachers recognize that as well. In fact, so much so that there was a fair number of teachers that would be supportive of starting that full week in August on the 24th. So to move those days, well, we marked them as Thursday and Friday. That Friday would be the orientation day for seventh and ninth graders. To actually move it all the way, those two days, the 24th and 25th, and have the students start on Wednesday, the 26th, potentially. So that is a consideration that would have support among uh, teachers. Um, we are prepared to send out a brief survey to the parents to gather feedback, but we wanted to limit the questions of this or this, this or this, and this is the impact on the end date. If we were to move up and did a full day, full week in August there, it would then, um, we could shave off the days in June, or we could make it a two, full three, two weeks in December, um, and then in which case the June date doesn't change. Yeah, there's really three options you can look at starting early, just a two weeks of winter break, or not two weeks of winter break. And two weeks of winter break starting earlier, two weeks of winter break starting the way it's listed here, and that impacts the end, the end date. Those are really three options. Not, not much more wiggle room after what we have here. Emily? Um, so I'm really glad to hear what you said about option B because I don't feel like that's something we can do on our own. I feel like that has to be a regional decision, like not just a Pentucket regional decision, but a like Northeast Massachusetts regional decision. Um, I am strongly against you having a professional development day the day, the Friday right before February vacation or any vacation. Having done that, it is not as impactful for the teachers to have a day and then have 10 days to not think about it and come back to your classroom and try to remember what it was that you were so excited about that you really wanted to try when you got back. Um, so, would you prefer that on a different day? I cannot say that we have solved this problem with 100% accuracy, but I will say I think it would fall better right after a long weekend or a vacation. However, that being said, I have heard a ton of feedback this year from parents who work all kinds of jobs, that the challenge for them, especially for people who don't get days like Veterans Day or Martin Luther King Day off, um, to have to find additional care for their kids for two days 
is extremely challenging. A bunch of people can't take vacation days, contiguous with long weekends and vacations. So that has come up on more occasions than I care to count this year. So I would like to see that considered, to see the PD days put attached to anything but a vacation for a long weekend. Um, I'm thrilled about vacation uh, election day also, particularly because I know that the specialists um, often have things that they can do on that day. There's a conference and such. Can I ask um, a clarifying question? Mm -hmm. uh, you reference avoiding early release days on the Fridays of long weekends. And, and no, vacation. no, PD days. Like, not early release days, but um, the full day okay. PD days. Okay. So, so, like, so this year we had Veterans Day on Monday, mm -hmm. and then teachers had a PD day on Tuesday. So the... Um, people who had to work on Monday, they don't get that day off. If they have to take that day off because their kids are already at school, to have to take two days can be burdensome mm -hmm. to two in a row, whereas if you can spread out sometimes, okay. people have mentioned that that would be easier. Um, does, that, does that include, like I said, so looking at January, for instance, where it has January 15th being an early release day for professional development, which is a Friday before I have, a Monday holiday in January. So, no, because the, this year for the first time, early release days have been able to be managed by DAS. Yes. So that is not the same burden on working parents okay. that a full day full with no yeah. child care available is. Okay. Um, my last comment, and I'm sorry, there are several, but um, I would really like to see an adjustment in the parent conference mm -hmm in time, elementary. I think, in elementary, mm -hmm. sorry, I don't know what happens, if, I mean, I know what happens, but I don't, I think it's insane that we are talking about parent communication in any way, and we get 10 minutes scheduled with our child's elementary school teacher once a year. I, that's tough. Thank you. So as you know, that the I'm, <laughs> I, 100%. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, just as a side note, some contracts also put in their contract their start date, i.e. we start the Monday before Labor Day, unless Labor Day is like this year and it's for the, so we may want to consider that so that every year we're not having to talk this back and forth. So we have, it's, uh, we do have a date yeah, that no, says that and it allows us to just with agreement with uh, the Teachers Association. Yeah, I just, some contracts have more clear language. All right. Uh, I can't bring it up online. What's the last day of school this year so far? That was a Friday. Because I just remember I'm one year, <laughs> it might have been, it might have been 2015 even, when we had all the snow. I felt like the kids got out practically in July and we went back before Labor Day that year. And we had very short, the kids had a short summer. So that would, I'd take that into consideration on what our Labor Day. It's the 19th, so that's not bad. Um, and to echo Emily's point, I, I can say as a parent, and I've heard from other parents too, when, and I, you just said it's a negotiation issue, but to keep in mind that when parent conferences aren't until December, it's a hard pill to swallow when you're four months in and you're hearing, well, your child has this bad habit or that bad habit. It's like, well, we could have broken that maybe a couple months ago if we had met then, or, you know, I, I just, Having it later is not the best. Uh, Bill and Chris? No. The one thing that I brought up, especially in what goes on in the high school, is I've always felt that it would be very helpful to meet parents in the second semester for parent conferences as well as in the first, in the sense that you've identified a problem in November. Where are you in May? But the, I know that's definitely a contractual issue as well. Um, is Good Friday on here? And what do you tend to do? I don't know when it is. I tried to look So Good Friday is? It's uh, April 2nd. <coughs> okay. So that would be a day. So it remains a day off. Okay. I know that this is not approval. Are there any other questions? Okay. So I don't know. Can I ask? Yeah. I don't know if you were looking for feedback or not for some of the options. We are, yeah. <laughs> One of the things you mentioned was like coming back two weeks before Labor Day. I think that would be a very hard pill to swallow. I think the way you have it set here, 
if the teachers are agreeable to coming back to that Thursday, Friday, and then the students the next week with that Friday off for Labor Day. Like, to me, that is similar to what we used to do. It's actually extra days than we used to do. Um, so I think that would be better, having them, having more than that, I think, would be having summer. So essentially, if teachers come back the 27th, 28th, and the 7th and 9th graders come back the 31st, and everybody comes back the 1st? No, the 7th and 9th graders would come for a half a day on oh, um, Friday the 28th. Okay. All students would start on Monday the 31st. Okay. I think the idea is for the next meeting, we can present you with the data that we've got from the survey. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you'll see both from uh, the teachers and the parents. But I think you also mentioned the Christmas holiday. Um, two weeks off would be great. Right. I don't think that it's worth pushing further out into June. That yeah, I think my opinion on that. Our, our sort of discussion about it was if we did actually start on the 24th with teachers, right. then the students came back on the 26th of August, right. a trade-off could be right. yeah. you do the full two weeks in December. You don't get out any earlier in June, right. mm -hmm. but you give right. both teachers and families yeah. the full two weeks in December. Mm -hmm. uh, this week, this past year, we came back on for a Thursday, Friday, and which was fine. A lot of districts did. Um, it's interesting, people talking about two days, whether it's two days before the break starting or two days after, and that two days before can be a lot more challenging than the two days after the break. But there's, there's no, you know, when it comes to the early release days and all this, I, districts change. Wednesdays, they go to Fridays. Fridays doesn't work, they go back to Wednesdays. They avoid the long weekends, then they put in the long weekends. So it's very cyclical, and, and no one's ever really quite exactly happy. Um, so. Right. Just to Emily's point too about long weekends and some people don't have Veterans Day. Like I know some families they take, like my husband will take the week of Christmas off. I don't know that he could get two weeks of Christmas off. So I think that might be an issue to consider too, just how parents would have to have two weeks home with the kids so, or look for resources. Chris? Um, and another thing that just came to mind. So this year, the way that we did it with Martin Luther King Day and then you had the professional development day, that had an impact on midterm schedules because the, so just So we avoided that. Yes, okay. So hopefully schedule. keeping that yep. in mind no, because we avoided that in this year's although I have to say I think the second table is kinda nice to have, it did spill the midterms into the next week. So Okay, so when do you um, when is this gonna come back to and he's mentioned a survey? Um, when do you need to switch committed to vote? Probably come back on the February. We give a survey out next week. Okay. We'll come back. Uh, it's going to be a long meeting. Budget. Oh, oh good yeah. people will be here for that meeting. It could be February, or March. Yeah. I mean, most people like it mm -hmm. to be out as quickly yeah, no. as possible. They really do make plans around it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the Student Opportunity Act. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Student Opportunity Act, you're going to hear me talk about this to no ends, but uh, we were the recipients of an additional $67,000, which you heard once, twice, thrice, we put numerous times, $67,000. Uh, because we are receiving money, those funds, we fall under one of the, there's two categories. You're either a district that was awarded more than $1.5 million, or you're a district that was awarded less than $1.5 million. It turns out we were awarded a little less, a little bit less than the $1.5 million. So, because there's the two categories, we are required to complete paperwork um, to receive that $67,000. And uh, Mr. Conway's gonna talk a little bit about that, but it does require your approval, so he's just gonna go over what the process is. We're excited to do this, we think it's worthwhile, and uh, it's worth about $67,000. <laughs> that didn't sound sincere at all. That's sincerity. Uh, <laughs> so this is, this is a, a legislative act, student, student Opportunity Act is a legislative act, so as, as in most cases, it would be a legislative act. There are requirements involved, um, and there are statutory requirements. Uh, we are fortunate that uh, I think the commissioner's office figured out a way to, I learned a new vocabulary word, uh, by, by proof 
So two different processes. So some for those who are getting more money and something far less of a, of a process for those getting less. Um, but we have some requirements. In particular, the state has identified four commitments. And the state themselves are backing up these commitments with the potential for additional resources, funding, and sources beyond our $68,000. So if we do this well, or aligned, it does actually give us greater access to more money, potentially, at hand. It would be focused on particular things. Their four commitment areas are, they want districts to have intentional focus on student subgroups who are not achieving at the same levels, not outside of what we're already planning. They want us to adopt, deepen, or continue specific evidence-based programs to close opportunity achievement gaps for those student subgroups. A lot of the work have already started and are continuing. They want us to identify and monitor success in reducing the disparities in achievement among those student subgroups. Again, we have a lot of this in place. We can do more with a few opportunities here. And they want us to engage families, particularly those families representing student subgroups most in need of support. And those are their four focus areas. Um, from the, they, they've given us a, a template, which Dr. Bartholomew and I have started working on already. They do not expect districts to turn this into a whole other strategic plan. If anything, just take some components of it and embed it into this document. Um, but they do want you to identify how are you going to use your money, your newfound riches, and address these four commitment areas. And, and we, we probably have, we have a pretty good idea about some things that we already had planned and where we can potentially apply that. It is, you know, it applies to the budget from that perspective. Um, <coughs> one of our statutory requirements though is we need to engage the community in discussions around this, what they call SOA plan, Student Opportunity Act plan. Um, so not only, I think timing is perfect, we have our budgetary hearing uh, at our next school committee meeting. I think one of my suggestions based on reading all the statutory requirements is that we add a component to our agenda where we specifically ask for community input on uh, the statute to on the Student Opportunity Act and those four commitment areas. We'll also ask our principals to engage their PTOs in the same questions around those four areas. Uh, from that, we'll be able to provide does, once we develop a plan, it does require the vote of the school committee. Um, so we, and that, this plan must be submitted by April 1st, so we need to turn this around, um, which isn't a big deal, uh, but we will need the community input on the 25th, and then the following meeting in March, I would suggest that the second, the agenda <coughs> item be on our first meeting in March, be a vote, discuss vote, approve, vote for approval, of our student opportunity plan. Um, what are Emily, would you include the school councils too, or just the PTOs? Yeah, so it could be school PTOs. councils, it could be PTOs. Okay. Uh, they may not meet in that time frame. So That's why I was it asking. It could be either one. Yeah, it could be either one. Okay. Um, but uh, just to gain feedback. And basically, we'll, we'll have a draft plan. Mm -hmm. We'll give that to principals to bring. And a lot of it is, is some things we're considering already. So much of it you're already well aware of them. We can sort of tie the, the state gave, gave a list of 17 evidence-based practices that they are advising districts select from. Um, you can select from something outside of those 17. You'll need to back it up. But in particular, within those 17, there are multiple ones that are bolded that are clearly going to be tied to more grant money opportunities particularly early literacy, for instance, which is going to be a huge focus for the state, and there will be greater access to more funding if that is our approach. And I would say it probably is. And there's a few others, too, that Dr. Bartholomew and I can continue to lead through. They're very clear, though, that this should not be, um, they want you to do a few things really well. They don't want you to do many things here. So identifying three, four, five things, and how much can we do with $68,000 anyways, but uh, we'll, we'll 
work through it. I have it. Any other questions? Right. So are you going to send something out to the public about participation in this and what the Student Opportunity Act is and how we could use their feedback on that? And yeah, so I think in the, the school committee agenda yeah. that will include a component about that and that will go out to the public as well and then we'll use the principals and either their site councils or their PTOs to have that discussion um, to gain that feedback and hopefully there will be some people present who can maybe speak to it. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. The next item on the agenda is policies. So we have some policies to vote on. Some of these are for second readings. The first policy is a um, motion for the first policy IGBH alternative programs. Move IGBH alternative programs. Second. Any discussion? Yes. Uh, so I know the format in the past has been to show, that we already talked about this, to show the changes that have been made from last time to this time. I understand why it wasn't included here. Can you kind of give a high-level summary of, do we just correct spelling errors or? This is the IGBH as it, so if you actually, this is one of the policies that if you click on it on our district website, it brings up the itinerary of policies. But if you look in the old policy binders, this is the writing in the policy that we had. Okay. Um, so there's been no change to so this th policy. Is this a second read or this is a first? I believe it's a second. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there hasn't been. So. Well, no, I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> so it's a first because no changes have been made. Okay. I apologize. I'm looking at the notes. Any other questions? All in favor of approving IGBH alternative programs? Can we please have a motion to accept policy IHBG homeschooling? Move IHBG homeschooling. Second. Any discussion? Yes. So again, I called Marie about a few of these. So this is when this came up the last time. My concern mm -hmm. is that what we're actually doing isn't what this policy says, and you kind of explain where this specific policy. Yeah, so this what is saying. specific policy, um, and I apologize, I didn't have the notes as usual. Um, but um, so this specific policy, I went through today and just looked it over again. Um, we have an act. So I think everyone knows this subcommittee has an active Google Doc, and then we discuss things in committee, and then President Brent you know, I hope they make comments that we take into consideration too in doing the policies. Um, so basically when we look at our, we look at our old policy, what we have, which is currently up on the website, and then we look at what the MASC current policy, so MASC has a reference manual online to all current policies and things that have been more updated. We look at those. Um, so last reading, the first reading, we brought to you a homeschooling policy that was all new MASC language. So then based on the concerns of the school committee versus superintendent approval um, and different input, we now have a blend of mask and PRSD language. When I say PRSD, I mean from the former policy that we had, as well as um, if you look at the first bullet point, 14 days before the program that was new ad added language um, based on a member's input, um, as well as the number five bullet point under the second, the any cost associated with it, that was also added language. Um, I went into the mass law that was stated to see why it says school committee and what it's referring to by school committee, and um, Dr. B had spoken to this too. For the most part, homeschooling, it'll all go through Dr. Bartholomew or his designee. The only reason it says school committee is because there is a law that says that we grant the diplomas and we approve that this is our requirements and we're granting diplomas based on those requirements and this is what that alludes to. Because I went back into math to see why the language is written the way it is, like why school committee has to be mentioned at all and that's the reason they do it is because the law is referenced and also the other law referenced is um, attendance law because we also set the attendance policy for the district. So 
the attendance policy, the requirements for graduation and the granting of diplomas does fall on school committee and that's why they reference them when it comes to homeschooling. But then Dr. B, maybe you can speak to, you said you've never had a homeschool student request, seek, request, request a request diploma. It, right. The homeschool students typically, they just apply on to college. Uh, I've never had in my career right. a homeschool student come back to its home high school and okay. request a diploma from its home high school. I'm sure, I'm sure it has happened. Right. So I know, I mean, in your tenure here, but yeah, would you say it's probably previous. feasible that that's why it hasn't come before the school committee? Or, I mean, you can't say for sure, but in your experience, you haven't seen I, it. I think if, if I'm a homeschool with my child, I, I don't know why I want to come back and get a diploma from high school. I okay. So I guess I go back to my original, and, and like I said the last time, is this has some history in that we used to actually see the names of the people looking for approval for homeschooling requests. We don't see that anymore. So my problem with the first paragraph is it still appears that we are, our hands are around it, and we are not relegating that authority, that oversight, that however you want to put it, to the superintendent or his or her designee. So I still feel that the way it reads, although it is appropriate with Mass General Law, right. it's not what we're actually doing. So how do we get what we're actually doing in practice to be represented in that? You know what I mean? I think we have to start practicing that. Because, I mean, if, if it's Mass General Law that requires the school committee, we don't really... But I think Mass General Law that. requires the school committee to do it, but then I think it also allows us to give to that... Yeah. So, so that's the piece that I think is missing okay. is that transition. And most districts designate it's okay. Be the superintendent or whoever it may right, be, right. be the superintendent. Um, that administration manages this, not okay. right. So, would you be more comfortable if that first line says requires the school committee or their, the superintendent or his or her designee? Well, either that or add a sentence that says the school committee gives this authority or relegates yeah. this, okay. whatever wording. Okay. To the super, so that so that we're saying yeah. yes, it's our responsibility, but we are giving that responsibility to you. Makes sense. Okay. Certainly, if there's problems, you got to come to us. But you know, or we should go back to seeing the lists and seeing the documentation. I don't think we should be doing that. <laughs> okay. So, um, so this is going to go back for a second reading. Yeah, second reading. Third reading. Second Thank reading. You. Third reading. Oh, you're right there. Third reading. Okay. Can I please have a motion to approve policy IHCA no. summer schools? No. So moved. Yeah. Second. Any discussion? I have a question. So it says that the focus of the program will be remedial work <laughs> yeah. in the first paragraph, but then it says down mm -hmm. in the third paragraph, students at all instructional levels may attend, approve summer schools for remedial enrichment or makeup purposes. That seems slightly contradictory mm -hmm. to the focus mm -hmm. of the program will be remedial work. Yep. Can we just, uh, you know, I can we add so, like <laughs> enrichment or makeup purpose at, to the beginning? Or, or just, yeah, remove that, the focus of the program will be remedial work. <coughs> so, at Kentucky, we have summer school, which is like an extended school year program for some population. We still do that. Special education. Yes. Yeah. Is that... This intention, or sure. this is no. when we used to yeah. offer summer classes and things like that. Okay, there's a separate policy separate for the. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion? Yes. Good. Are we amending this on the fly, or are we going for another reading? Because it would seem to me, uh, based on the concerns that I've heard, it could be in the first paragraph. The focus of the program will be uh, remedial work. Uh, let's see, what am I looking for? It's all listed in the third no, paragraph. Well, right. Yes. Just we if we that if out. Right. either delete that sentence in the first paragraph or just keep the one in the third delete and we're golden. Sense. Okay. Is that, is but okay. is that okay? Okay, so. So can I make a motion to approve the, I, I, 
policy IHCA with the last, amendment to last sentence of the first with paragraph. The, yeah. To delete the last sentence of the first paragraph. Second. <coughs> Amen. Okay. Um, any other discussion? Okay. All in favor of the amendment? <laughs> okay. Everybody good? Can I please have a motion to accept policy no, no. IJK supplementary materials selection and adoption? Move IJK supplementary materials. Second. Second. Any discussion? All right. So this is the policy as it is currently online, and we haven't changed anything. And this is the first read. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor? Next policy is IJL R library materials. I'm sorry, library materials selection and adoption. Move IJL R library materials selection and adoption. Second. Second. Any discussion? The same. This doesn't change from the 2010 policy. No other discussion. All in favor? Thank you. That's it for the policies. Uh, the next item on the agenda, the last item, is on graduation balance. So I request that this be added to the agenda um, for the purpose of um, inclusion in our school district. So historically, we've always had the, the, the males, or the boys, wear um, green gowns, and the females or the girls wear the white gowns. And then, um, I'm not sure how long ago, but um, the kids were given an option to choose between both colored gowns, um, which is great. However, um, those gowns still come with historical um, gender exclusion. Um, so I would like to see um, LGBT um, Q plus community um, not this, not to have this be a worry for them, um, and I have reason to believe because um, I had a parent as well as a um, mental health provider from the area approach me about this um, in our school district. So, you know, I, I went and I contacted um, the Department of Education and Safe Schools, and they sent me some documentation that I shared um, with the committee um, in regards to. Um, what they recommend school districts do in this in this um, situation. So um, I can read to you um, page five of the documentation, um, and this is under other gender-based activities, rules, policies, and practices in schools. And it states the new the new law on gender identity provides a good opportunity for schools to review their gender district policies. For example, some schools require students to wear gender-based garb for graduation or have gender-based dress codes for prom, special events, and daily attire. Schools should eliminate gendered policies and practices such as these. For example, one school that previously had blue graduation gowns for boys and white ones for girls switched to blue gowns for all graduates. Um, and then it goes on to say the school also changed its gender based dress code for the National Honor Society ceremony which had which had required girls to wear dresses. Um, and then there's other documentation too on you know making sure that this um, student population is included. So I went a little further on that. Um, I, mean, I got that information directly from um, DESC. I, I contacted them and they, they emailed it to me. So um, I went and I also contacted um, 66 schools in Essex and Middlesex County. And there was more schools in those counties, but those are the schools that I was able to get through um, on the phone with. And um, in the document I provided you, I included telephone numbers and for extensions, if anybody also wants to follow up on these calls. Um, but out of the 66 schools I surveyed, 47 of them have um, all their students wearing one color graduation gown and sometimes the gowns might be a combination of two colors. Um, 
and 10 schools out of the 66. Um, do the two colors only with option to choose, and these colors were um, gender exclusive in the past, much like Pentucket. But there are a couple of school districts that they do the two colors, but they have the kids wear them depending on either where they're sitting. Like the first row at the graduation might wear red and the second row might wear blue. Or another school district um, goes by alphabetical order. Um, like the A through L wears red and then M through Z wears blue. There were three um, schools that I contacted that are currently um, still deciding how to move forward with this um, for the same reason why I, I requested this to be added to the agenda. And out of the 66, there were four um, that do um, male, female, colors only, no options, and they're not gender inclusive. So I think um, I would like to see Kentucky look at this. And um, you know, I, we always want our schools to be all inclusive. And I think, you know, this is a, such a something that we need to discuss. So I have two things. Um, Manchester, Manchester Essex Regional High School has also switched, so this has it as it doesn't define it, and they um, have gone to all green as well. So I might I'd like to make a motion that we um, move to um, one color for single color gowns um, for the Pentecost graduating seniors. Second. Dr. B, and then Chris. Just two things. The uh, part you read, Madam Chair, is actually part of the language that we've adopted uh, for our guidance document of gender bias. And also, we went and did our, just in the Cape Ann League, including Manchester, Essex, and Haverhill, um, of the 12 schools, including that, Hamilton, Wenham, and Linfield, like the two, I don't know if they require. And all the other schools are just one color for their gals. So I guess my question is an overall question. Is this to me doesn't fall under the school committee purview necessarily? I think certainly if we're practicing something that is against the law or that is not inclusive, I think what we do, what is currently happening is not in that situation if there should be some changes i don't know that it necessarily should come from our level i think it actually should come from either student or administration kind of figuring out here's where we are if people aren't comfortable what should we as a community do i don't i, I don't feel comfortable saying well we should wear all green or we should like like i think it has to be more of a conversation and i think our students are not all, because in the population, you're not going to have everybody accepting of everybody next to them. But I think our population is very aware of situations that have come up as they've gone through school. And, and I think I just would be uncomfortable saying, well, the school committee is making this decision. That's what we're going to do. And I don't know if that's what you're necessarily looking for right now. Um, but I kind of feel that this is an opportunity. You know, it's the same thing as the sachem. There are people who, who don't believe that the sachem is an inappropriate. Um, mascot for us but there are people who do believe that so should we get rid of it because one person is upset or not I don't know I think that has to be a conversation that we as a community that we as a school I don't think it's something that we as a school committee it's it's I don't think that's our place Madam Chair. I, I support your motion and I think uh, I think it's time as we spoke earlier concerning As we spoke earlier concerning times have changed, I think that this recognizes a change in our society, and I don't think we're the only people to do it. And I personally think it is in the purview of this committee to make that recommendation. So I do support your motion. And I mean, I'm not saying we should pick green over white. You know, I mean, there's comp no, a combination of colors. I don't. So the motion I mean, I just single color. Yeah. yeah, motion is single color. Right. I'm totally in support of all inclusivity and changes and whatnot. I guess I go back to when I thought about this after you get into us last night. I was just going back to, um, I think maybe it's a, maybe as a committee we vote to 
throw it back to the students and do a survey maybe to see what they would like, if they would like, you know, all green, all white, if they would like it to be right by row, whatever the choices are. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, we don't touch choice. dress code. We don't trust, you know what I mean? Like, there's other areas of policy that, I mean, we certainly have policy that supports inclusivity, inclusive I'm trying to. <laughs> but I guess I'm, I'm saying I'm in favor of it. I just, to your point, like I don't want to say everyone has to wear green, everyone has to wear white. I'd like to see the students have some feedback on that. Almost like we are throwing the calendar back. Like what, what would your choices be? Um, so I, w I wish this had come from the student body. <laughs> yeah. I do in other high schools it has. Um, but I do think that in pieces of the policy um, it is our responsibility as you know the, pol the operating body of the policy, and um, you know with the, the administrators as well, to keep all kids safe and mm -hmm. feeling um, that they absolutely are accepted for who they are. And I think that although past practice has allowed people to choose, and that is a step, um, I I think that we can stand up and say like this is how we keep all of the kids feeling like they don't have to stand up and say you know what I would really like to but I feel nervous saying that to my peers because that is often part of the problem I have no problem throwing it back to the student body to pick the color I, I don't think that's our job but So I would almost add on to that and say that maybe our vote is not to choose one color, mm -hmm. but is to say that um, we task administration and the student body to come up with a solution that is more inclusive than what we presently that have. Change, yeah. like, like I really feel that this should be something no that has their input. <coughs> okay. I don't agree at all. I think this is the responsibility of this body. Otherwise, we'd have to put it back to the students each and every year. I ran graduation for years, and if you have an understanding of graduation, there's a single student that may or may not be there that would interrupt a single row. So alternating colors or row colors or anything else can be extremely problematic. This takes off all the pressure of anybody and reduces it to our body's decision to make it nice and simple. It's a single color. You want to choose the color, beautiful. That's the input you have. But what's on the board right now is probably the most simplistic, and I believe it's our responsibility, and I agree with Emily. So can I call for the vote? So, I, so the motion right now is what? To move to a single color graduation for all students. But not so a single I don't care what color. So the motion was that all students be wearing the same color, whatever color that is decided by whoever decides that. I just want to put it out there that, you know, LGBT students, they have a very, very high suicide rate. Um, and it's, it's because they're not accepted. Um, and I think I'm very cautious putting it out to the students to, to vote um, because not everybody is accepted. Um, and I don't think this is the same, and I'm not, I don't feel that this is the same thing as voting for the mascot. Um, I don't think the mascot, I, I think that's a whole other thing. To me, that's a caricature. That, that's, 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 that's the school, it's a school mascot. Um, this, I think, is much more personal. Um, for people, you know, for people that, um, you know, they, they want to feel included. They want to feel that, you know, they, they can be who they, they want to be or not have to pick. Um, you know, and the same thing with the restrooms and the locker rooms, you know. You know, the, the, the kids that might be transgender, the kids that might be non-binary, um, they always have to pick. And I think, you know, I, I don't think that they should have to pick. I don't think they should have to be given a choice, especially, you know, with the historical connotations attached to the two colors and boys wear one color and girls wear the other. And it's almost the same thing with the, um, the middle school where they used to have the colored teams. Uh, those colors 
no matter how you worked them, there was always connotations attached to them. Um, and there was history behind those colors. And I think, you know, that may have made some kids feel pretty badly as well. So, um, you know, that's, that's my feeling on it. Um, so, unless there's any other comments or questions, I guess we move forward to vote. So, all in favor to moving graduation gowns to all the same color. Okay. Not in favor? I'm going to abstain. Okay. Thank you. So, as a follow up, now that that has passed, my hearing, I have comments on it, I know it's not a vote, is the direction that this point the administration survey the children, survey the students, to find out if they like all white, all green, all green with white stoles, all white with green stoles, some combination. That's okay. Right? Okay. So do we need a vote on that? Mm -hmm. Do we need a motion to vote on that? I don't think it's something that's our responsibility. Okay. Right. Well, the kids pay for them themselves, right? Right. So let them pick that call. Okay. Right. Well, Whatever it may the be. class offices and advisors do it on a year-to-year -year basis. I mean, that's very simplistic. They can make their own poll for their own class, and that is a decision-making that they can do without harming anyone. So, and I don't think it's a big deal. I think they can do it quite easily, and uh, I hope they'll come back. That's something we don't have to decide for them. Okay, thank you. Um, Anything else? Okay, next item. Next item on the agenda is public comment. Not seeing any. Okay, so um, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Emily, did you lose your job? Job? Yeah, you didn't uh, raise your hand for adjournment. Did we make this? Uh, 